And now, from God's Unchanging Word Studios in New Orleans, we are pleased to bring you news, nuggets, and insights with today's host, Tom Carey. Well, greetings, everyone, and welcome to God's Unchanging Word in another edition for our news nuggets and insights. Today is Friday, June 4th, 2021. We pray and trust everyone had a great Memorial Day weekend. So now let's get right into our program for this week. The Middle East, 11 days of rockets. I'm going to bring out a number of things tying in the Middle East to the United States and our spending. Millions of dollars flowing into the Middle East. And then we're going to connect the seventh day. Why is that not a holy day? The seventh day of the Feast of Tabernacles. As you know, the sevens are usually holy time. Talk about that today. All righty, let's get right into the program. We're going to begin with this from New York City, the continual push toward pedophilia. This is from Media Blaze. New York City Department of Education features drag queen for the show now aimed at three to eight year olds that's being aired on PBS. And they're bringing it into schools as part of their curriculum. Unbelievable what they're continuing to do. This is what they're saying when they bring these, our children to these people. I think we might have some drag queens in training on our hands. Watch how they turn and make this such an encouraging role model. <clears throat> Do you remember when you were growing up? What do we look at when we wanted the astronauts and you tend to the military? Something there that's going to bring about uh, some kind of honor to you and your family. But this is what they're doing today to our youth. The New York City Department of Education featured the drag queen known as Little Miss Hot Mess. Even that sounds sweet. In a show aimed at three to eight year olds, aired on PS, wherein the performer and the, and the author declared, I think we might have some drag queens in training on our hands out there. Just imagine if you're a child sitting at the audience, would you like to be a drag queen when you go out? Would you like to be? I think we have some in training right now, encouraging them to become what God says is an absolute abhorrent evil. And there we are, just taking our children, and just pushing them in and turn them over to this society. You even got a book. Look at, look at that book. Leave that up there, Jeff, just for a second. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you the title there. The hips on the drag queen go swish, swish, swish. All for little boys who want to be little girls. Here's what she says. I am a drag queen and the children and a children's book author, Little Miss Hot Miss begins. And you may be wondering to yourself, what on earth is a drag queen? The host then described the drag queens in part as everyday people who like to play pretend and dress up as often as we can. Going on to say, drag queens are also leaders in our community. And if you ask me, we make a pretty good role model. What do you think a child three-year-old is going to think when they hear all this? The Bible says you train up a child in a way that they should go, and when they're old, they'll not depart from it. The Catholics knew about that, and now it evidently our society knows about it, because you see, they're saying that these are now the new role models for our children. Unbelievable. All right, how about this one? Another one, you can't make this stuff up. Transgender women in sports. Now, we've been hearing about it in the USA, and it's been going all over the country how unfair this is to the, to the girls or the young women who are in training. And actually, those are in sports, getting college education and scholarships. But it's all being changed right now. So, so much for the protection of the woman, as the left used to say. So here we go, heading to the Summer Olympics. I'm not making this up. A transgender is going to the Summer Olympics. You ready? This again from the blaze. New Zealand now is sending a transgender woman weightlifter, Laurel, Laurel Hubbard, to the Olympics. And one of the uh, participants there said, this is like a bad joke to biological female athletes and competitor complaints. Are you ready? Let's keep the picture up here now, Jeff. Look, at, look what's going. That's now a woman who's going to compete against women. There you go. Unbelievable. Can't make it up. Can't make it up. All right, one more. You can't make this stuff up before we actually get into the other portions of our program. This again, right here in America, 
a mayoral candidate for mayor in Atlanta, runs on defund the police, which is not unusual in this day and time. So he's running for a candidacy. He goes to, again, this is not making up, I'm trying to be serious here. He goes to one of his events, and while he's there, this happens. The Antonio Brown who voted to defund the police, his call was stolen. <laughs> defund the police. An Atlanta mayoral candidate who voted to sequester $73 million from the city's police department budget reportedly had his car stolen by a group of young thieves this week. He actually had to call the police. I wonder why I didn't call that other group. What do they call those people? Um, say it again. Social workers. That's right. Social workers. Why didn't you just call a social worker to come get you? It's because he was hanging on the car for almost a block while these four kids stole his car and drug him down the street. But he didn't call a social worker. He called the police. Unbelievable. I don't understand how these people get away with this because, you know, they, you know, they do because they got the media on their side. So we have a, a media that just absolutely lies to us. Over and over and over again. All right, let's get to some more stuff that's actually more serious than that. That's funny, but that's serious because, see, that's nonsense. God says he's going to take the, the mind of the leadership in our nation and become devoid. And he's going to take all the wisdom away from the wise. And there we have it. And we're sick from the head to the toe. So I guess it's not really funny. But when you think about it, it's just like so bizarre. All right, World Watch. Middle East, close to the war. Remember, they come close to a war again, what was going on. And I don't know how you describe it other than a war when you got 4,300 rockets being shot into your nation. 11 Day of Rockets changes the world's sentiment to support the aggressor. That's what's going on here. They support the aggressor, the people who actually began all of this. So now I'm going to break this down into a couple different segments as we go through this. First, the 11 Days of the Rockets, financing the attack. I'm going to show you how this all came about in the time frame. So when I go into the slides, I'm going to try to take particular interest to some of the dates, and I'm going to show you how the dates was. Because you see, we haven't seen this type of attack for many, many years. It's because they have, they've cut off the funding to Hamas and to Iran. But all of a sudden now, they got plenty of money again. So now they can begin to shoot these rockets, costing millions of dollars, 4,300 of them. So where do you get the rockets and where do you get the money from? And we're going to talk about the changing world sentiment. That's what this whole thing was about as we went, went through this. All right, so now let's begin with this. So changing the sentiment. On May 27th, the UNHRC, which is the UN Human Rights Council, approved a measure on Thursday to permanent, permanently investigate Israel for war crimes while also calling for an embargo against it. So now they want to for Israel, because they're defending themselves, and because they were shooting, they said, into civilian territories, not to mention that's where the rockets were coming from. See, the, they're swift. The, the Palestinians, and they understand that they're going to put their rockets in hospitals, by schools, by children's uh, playgrounds, so that's where they shoot from. So when Israel fires back to take out the rocket launchers, they're right where the people are, and they know that. And Israel even tries to get time get to tell you, get out, because we're going to blow the area up to get people away. So now, it's a war crime to defend themselves from doing this. And if they didn't take out the rocket launchers, they would continue to shoot, because there were 4,300 rockets, so Israel retaliated with 1,500 strikes back. Now, it's talking about permanently investigating war crimes. In other words, this will never end. It'll just continue to investigate no matter what. They're just going to continue to investigate. Bahrain voted in favor of the resolution, along with other countries with the poor human rights records. Now, isn't that the way it normally is? Those who are accomplished to this type of behavior support the investigation to those who are not, like Christians being investigated today, including Russia. I'm sorry, China, Russia, Cuba, Libya, Uzbekistan, Somalia, Pakistan, and Venezuela. All of these, does that look like that's human rights in these nations? And the world doesn't see it. I don't, uh, the United States doesn't recognize it. The left's not speaking out against it and under the what's going on here. 
The UN opening comments, this is right from the very beginning of that segment on the war crimes. In her opening statement to the Council, the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights, Michelle Brechelet, said that Israel's airstrikes on Gaza may constitute war crimes. In other words, they'll begin to try arresting them or hanging them for what they're doing in defending themselves. In response, Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu called it a shameful decision in that the council had shown a blatant anti-Israel obsession. He said, this is appalling. One-sided anti-Semitic resolution has effectively predetermined the results of the so-called investigation. And basically, that's what goes on here in America. They don't have a crime, so they begin to go investigating, looking for a crime so they can charge. And that's what they're doing here in the UN. Absolutely abhorrent. It went on to say, it ignores that the rockets fired at Israel civilians equates Israel with Hamas, a terrorist organization, thereby legitimizing Hamas and the other terrorist organizations worldwide. Going on. The 11 nights of rockets to victory. Hamas claims victory even as Gaza lies in ruins. This is amazing. How they can claim an absolute victory in Gaza when everything about them lies with, in destruction and hundreds of people killed. They got a victory. Well, they got the victory because they got what they were looking for. This came from Financial Times. Palestinian militants, defiant as blockaded enclave, is left shattered by Israeli airstrikes claiming victory. All right. So now, let's see what they had in their victory. What did they get? Middle East reset, unleashing billions of dollars into the Middle East. Now, U.S. dollars begin to flow money into that area. We're talking about billions of dollars in more than just one way. So. Now we're back to a reset, back to pre-2017, trying to get back into 2015. What happened in 2015? Remember the 2015? Well, Iran wants to go back to the 2015 deal. And they're demanding they're not going to take anything less than everything they had before. But recently, they've said they began to negotiate. They may be opt to open for a couple of changes in the, in the meantime. All right, this is from Foreign Affairs, May 25th. Iran needs the nuclear deal to keep Russia and China at bay. The geopolitical gains will last longer than the military concessions. So they got geopolitical gains, they got support, and now they're getting the finances. The Supreme Leader Ayatollah Ali Khamenei has suggested that the negotiations in Vienna, this is coming up very soon, a new and binding agreement, the diplomatic door is open for the United States and Iran to reach a more robust deal that will uh, weather transitions and administrations in both countries. So what they're looking for now, they realize, the deal they had would only last that administration. Whoever comes in next, it goes back to the way things were. So what they're trying to do, and they realize that there's a possibility if, if the Republican side got back in again, it can go back to the way it was. So now they're trying to create a deal that so no matter who goes in, Whatever, whatever uh, political party takes over, that it will not affect the flow of money and support that they're going to be giving to Iran. So they're going to try to get a better deal than they had in 2015. So that's what they're doing right now. Unbelievable, but it continues to roll up and undo everything that the United States had been able to accomplish. This is from Netanyahu. It says that they will not allow Iran to obtain a nuclear weapon. This has been their stance. Now, what's going on over there, I don't have this in here, but on the political edge, just like here in America, a strong hand is not welcomed any longer. They're trying to get him put out, and there's a chance that they could have a party be developed that will move him in out of the way and give a softer approach from Israel, which again will destabilize and actually bring about the destruction of Israel if they do that. God says at the end time, armies are going to surround Jerusalem. But this is the one person who's standing in the way from that actually happening right now. So whether that will happen right yet or not, we don't know, but we're paying attention to that. This is out of Jerusalem from the Reuters, April 5th. 
Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu said Monday, April 5th, that Iran has never given up efforts to obtain nuclear weapons and that Israel will not allow Tehran to build them. In other words, as long as he's in power, they're never going to get a nuclear weapon. And we've seen over the years that every time they got closer to be able to move to their next stage, something would happen and Israel would have a strike to be able to put that off and delay it even further. It is a continual battle that continues to take place in the Middle East. Now, way back on March 29th, China now, how are we getting all these rockets and how are they getting the money to fund them? Well, the funding now has began to shift again. When the administration came in, when the Biden administration came in, they took off most of all the sanctions, and now they're beginning to relieve all the sanctions on their money, and everyone who had uh, an agreement with Iran can go back into the agreements and begin to open up new agreements. This was the big one. China, with a $400 billion Iran deal, will deepen the influence in the Middle East. The countries signed a sweeping pact on Saturday that calls for heavy Chinese investments in Iran over 25 years in exchange for oil. That was the one thing that Iran had that the embargo was countries could not buy their oil, which kept them suppressed so they could not continue to fund the terrorism the way they were doing it in the past. All that's gone, and within four months, the first thing you see 4,300 rockets fired into Israel to begin to change the sentiment and begin to get the negotiations going again to their good. Releasing funds, March 7th. The United States has agreed to release $3 billion of Iranian funds that have been frozen in Iraq, Oman, and South Korea due to Washington sanctions. The Iranian trade official, Hamad Hassani, <clears throat> told the semi-official FARS news group on Sunday. So now we've got $3 billion now that is funding that's being released to them that was on hold. Now they can use it for whatever they want to, including terrorism. The Biden administration was quietly during this entire time. Now look at the date, March 31st. Biden administration quietly ramping up aid to the Palestinians. Watch how this works. They began to announce finding consumer sentiment, right? See how well the public, this, just throw that out there and see how, it, how it's received. The administration announced last Thursday, back in March 31st, that it was giving $15 million to the vulnerable Palestinian communities. All right, so now it's, it's A. We've got we to gotta go help another $15 million. You know, you keep hearing trillions and billions, so that's $15 million. Well, it's taxpayer money. That's what it is. It's, it's your money. That the government who's voted in office, they do whatever they want to do with this taxpayer money. It has nothing to do with our nation. It's whatever's going to be the best interest for them and their party and buying off these different nations. $15 million to vulnerable Palestinian communities in the West Bank and Gaza to help fight COVID-19 pandemic. But it doesn't go to that. It goes to tunnels and military and weapons. A day later, a day later, with no public announcement, it notified Commerce that that $15 million now has been raised to $75 million. In other words, there was no pushback at 15, so let's up it. Let's go a little bit further for economic support to be used and to regain their trust and goodwill. Well, it started off with what people say, oh, it's COVID, let's help them because it's COVID. Now, it's for trust and goodwill. In other words, we're going to give you money so that we can trust one another. Isn't that nice? <clears throat> and goodwill. Let's not forget goodwill. Remember, I mean, after, after all, I mean, even in our own United States, you know, sometimes some of these states and countries, like here in Louisiana, we said, we got the best politicians money can buy. Right? You've heard that before. Well, this here is, is money, and, you know, God condemns this. And I'm going to show you the scripture in just a few minutes. But let's go on. The Biden administration to restore 235 million. Now we're up to 235 million on April 7th. That's just a week later. So we went from 15 to 75. Now we're at 235 million in just a little over a week. You, to the Palestinians, U.S. foreign assistance for the Palestinians serves an important U.S. interest in values. This is before the rockets. This is before the rockets. 
adults. They're getting all of this. It provides critical relief to those in need of fosters economic development and supports Israel-Palestinian understanding. Well, we understand it hasn't changed. It's been this way for decades. And it continues to be this way. And this is just another reach and push to continue to put hands into a terrorist organization and community going on. U.S. now, May 20th, post rockets. U.S. looks to rebuild Gaza, but aid could hinge on Hamas's rocket arsenal. Oh, we want to help you, but, you know, we've got to talk about these rockets now. The effort could cost billions. 15, 75, 235 million, and now we've got rockets. Well, who started the rockets? Who started the, war the warfare again, escalating the problem in the Middle East? The same people now that we're giving millions and billions to now to tell them, quit firing rockets. And whose money is it? Oh, by the way, that's your taxpayer money, remember? Who authorizes this? The effort could cost billions of dollars, and the U.S. officials predicted it would be welcomed by Hamas. I guess it would. Just this morning, I wanted to put it in. I didn't have enough time. There's another article came out by Gatestone talking about how we have just reversed complete policy in the Middle East that was working to stabilize and bring peace. It has all been shifted, and now what we're doing is we're using funds to reward bad behavior. A terrorist group. So what do they do next time? Who do they attack next? And get more money. But it would moderate military groups and sanctions toward Israel. Now, this I'm going to show you. This is, this is going to blow you away. With a ceasefire between Israel and Palestinian militants underway, the Biden administration is now turning to how it can help rebuild the besieged Gaza Strip. They create the environment. They pick the strategic locations where people are to bring about a humanitarian relief, bring about their own destruction, knowing, absolutely knowing, it's going to kill their own people, men, women, and children. They do it anyway destroy it, and then go back and say, we need some help to rebuild. So now they're going to rebuild. We're going to, we're going to pay to rebuild. Now watch this. And in turn, bring pressure. Now we're going to bring pressure on them. How are we going to bring pressure? We're going to give them more money. We're going to demand you take more money so you don't fire rockets. So in return, they're going to bring pressure through promises of financial support. <laughs> You might have to do like I did. I had to read that a couple times. Wow, I wish somebody would pressure me that way. Yeah, give me money so I can behave myself. Unbelievable. And we're not talking just millions now. This is talking about billions of dollars. All of those city lane and ruin is going to be rebuilt. And who's going to rebuild it? You are. Your taxpayer money is going to rebuild it. Who started it? They did. They create the war. They change the environment. They win the support. Israel now becomes a, a terrorist group because they're defending themselves, and you get to pay for it. Unbelievable. The Bible says we're sick from our head to our toe. We are. We absolutely are. Look what Hosea says in Hosea book chapter 8. Israel is swallowed up. She is now among the nation like something that no one wants. And we look at the United States and people around the world, all these countries, they're laughing. They are laughing a blue streak at the stupidity of this nation. While all this is going on, we're sitting here fighting wokeness and transgenders and you know, the ideologies of, of a sick society. Verse 9, for they have gone up to Assyria like a wild donkey wandering alone. Ephraim has sold herself to her lovers. That's what we've done. We're telling these people, we can, listen, we're going to threaten you. We're going to give you money so you can behave yourself. Isn't that a threat? Oh, isn't that scary? Oh, wow. So, so what do they do? They just don't shoot rockets right now. They take the money. They rebuild the cities. In the meantime, they rebuild their arsenals from the money that we have just released. So in essence, what we're doing here is the United States is, is essentially funding the terrorism indirectly to the Middle East. 
and removing any of the obstacles for other countries now to continue to build Iran so they're going to be this terror organization in power again. And in four months, just four months. Wow. You know, I used to wonder how fast things could turn. I said, there's no way it could turn that fast, but they are. They're moving faster than anyone ever imagined that they're moving, going on. Let's continue with this. It says, although they have sowed themselves among the nations, I will now gather them together, and they will begin to waste away under the oppression of the mighty king. God says, yeah, you can scatter yourselves, and you can go all over the place, but God says, I'm going to pull you together, and you're going to waste away. And that's what's coming. We have, we have taken all the resources of this great nation. We've taken the, the, the food, the funds, your taxpayer dollars, and they just spend it in a massive amount of money all around the world for green. Or and I sit back, we watch the Weather Channel every morning and see what's basically going on. And we talk about hurricanes and jokingly say, well, how much money does it cost us in green now so that we don't have hurricanes this year? Well, maybe we'll give another couple of billion, we won't have a tornado. And then, then Audrey brought out this morning, I'd like to take credit for this, the greatest environmental change there ever was in the green change, it was Noah. <laughs> it was Noah. And who brought that about? God did. Just like he's bringing about the destruction at the end time, as he promised he would, in Leviticus 26, Deuteronomy 28, through Daniel, through the prophets Isaiah, Ezekiel, and through Revelation. And this world has no idea what's coming in. And there's no amount of money you can put out there that's going to change a single thing. The destruction that's coming, God says, is going to come unless this nation and this world repents. And it will not repent. And it destroys those. It attacks those who say they must repent. They kill the messenger, just like they did with Jesus Christ. Now, let's go on with the debt. All right, so now, let's carry this on just in the... In, in the vein of what we're talking about, the debt and spending out of control. This is from Gatestone. A sinking ship of state drowns everyone. This is an article by Gatestone. These people got their, their finger on the pulse of the world's economy. This is from Wall Street. What's in the Biden $6 trillion budget? In case you didn't hear, there's a new budget out there for next year. $6 trillion. We haven't had a budget like this ever. Is equivalent to what the United States spent during World War II. In one year, this is going to be spent in one year. That's just the budget. That's the annual budget. Somebody tells you that's spent out over 10 years. No, it's not. This is the budget for one year. So what are they talking about, $6 trillion? Well, there's another $6 trillion that he's talking about. But right now, the budget is proposing, beginning October 1st, including a $1.5 trillion in discretionary spending. I love that. Discretionary spending. A trillion. One point, one and a half trillion dollars. That means I can spend it for whatever I want. It's discretionary. So do you remember when Adolf Hitler says, look, just give me enough power. You know, it's only going to last for a little while. I'll put everything in back in the way it's supposed to be, and then we're all going to get along just fine. When you start giving this kind of discretionary spending out there, there's no end to what damages this is going to cause. For military, domestic, right? Well, it's discretionary. They can do what they want to. By the way, I don't know if you have noticed it, but we were watching the History Channel yesterday talking about the world wars. One of the things that came out that really struck me, it kind of just shakes your nerves, is the same condition in pre-war is happening today is there was in the 30s to the 40s. Because you see, remember, we had the economic collapse. We had the Wall Street that just absolutely just, just destroyed itself. The world went into chaos. So to get enough money available to put things back, you know where they had to take the money from? The military. You know where the budget's going now? They're taking it from? The military. While the rest of the world in the 20s and 30s, we talked a little bit about that in the recent sermon that I gave, is history repeating itself? By the way, that's going to be offered in the court at the end of this program. It is exactly the same thing. So while we're reducing our, our spending on the military, by World War II, we, was, we were like 23rd or 20th in the world of military power, believe it or not. So the rest of the world, China, Russia, 
Iran, the Middle East, Japan. Everybody's building their militaries, and what are we doing? We're taking the money away. We're spending it as a woke thing or giving it to other nations. People need to wake up and pay attention to what's going on here. You need to help me take this program, the, everything I'm showing you today. If they can't believe the Bible itself, look at the facts of what's going on. And if that doesn't wake them up, I don't know what will. But we need to continue to push this out. So please help take this to everybody you know. All right, let's go on. Biden is planning another additional nearly $6 trillion in spending over the next decade. Now, this is what people are talking about over the next decade. What is he going to do? It's called the American Rescue Plan, $1.9 trillion, American Jobs Plan, $2.3 trillion, and the American Family Plan, $1.8 trillion. That's another $6 trillion. Of the three, the first one has already passed Congress. That's already out there, and the money's going. You know they got so much cash that's being pushed out there right now, they can't spend it fast enough. They got money just sitting there, so, so some of the committees are saying, we don't need to pass more bills, just reallocate the money that hasn't been spent and used yet. When you talk about talking about trillions of dollars, by the way, I'm going to find that. We, we had one time uh, the little block showing you the differences in size between the million and the billion and the trillion. And when you see the trillion, it's unbelievable what you see. So when you talk about trillions of dollars and how much it takes, they can't get it out there fast enough. And that creates an inflationary because there's so much money, people start bidding up prices on everything because everybody's got money. The second two, they're still in the blueprint stage and they have not been ready for the public yet, but they're coming. So now we've got on the drawing boards right now with the $6 trillion, trillion for the budget next year, plus or this, another $12 trillion, plus we've already spent $4 trillion to fight, or $6 trillion already to fight the COVID. When all this stuff hits, it's going to absolutely just bottom out this nation. And that, this could have begin hitting as early as 2022, which is, by the way, a Shemitah year. In seven years from 2015, when all this stuff began to turn around. We're going to talk about that in the sermon that I'm delivering this Saturday. So if you don't have anywhere to go, I want you to pay attention. Try to tune in, and God willing, we have a... a uh, an internet that works this week. Every time we do something important, it seems like Satan's out there and just wrecks the internet down here for us. But anyway, hopefully we can get that out there. Going on with the Gatestone. A sinking ship drowns, a state drowns everyone. Here's what they said. To be clear, the spending bill is actually the creation of a national debt so massive that it has the means to destabilize a democracy dependent on the functioning economy. Isn't that amazing? This is what's being, this, this thing is so big that it can just de destabilize everything. And if America becomes destabilized, the rest of the world is in place now. They will move away from this country. The dollar will no longer be the standard, and you will watch a tumble just like you're seeing right here of this nation going right down the tube. For the Chinese Communist Party, seeking to master the 21st century as one global superpower, it represents the strategic victory without so much as firing a single bullet. That's what they've done to the rest of the world right now. They know that an economically weakened America cannot possibly sustain its military leadership when it is burdened with paying down a massive debt. And that's what happened pre-World War II. We ordered that documentary series from, from History Channel, and I'm going to be going through that and pulling out certain segments that they have documented showing how all of this is actually in play again right now. Right now, all this is in play again. We are taking away from our military. So what do we have? We have commercials. I'm going to show you hopefully next week how we're bringing in the women and transgenders and the, and the, the, the homosexual family, putting them in the military. And that's what the rest of the world is going to have to fight. This nation is sick. It is really sick and going down fast. Our allies and underlying nations recognize this threat as well and will reinvent their relationship with China. And that's what they're doing. They're moving away from the United States and they're aligning with China, just like Iran did. So is the rest of the world. This is an economic a recipe for an economic collapse, which comes at a time when new job creation has stagnated and the scepter of a serious inflation has begun to emerge. As historians will tell you, if we have the wisdom to listen, 
No one escapes the devastation of a debtor nation. No one. God told us that thousands of years ago, Deuteronomy 28. The stranger that is within you shall get high above you, and, and very high, and you shall come down very low. He shall lend to you, and you shall not lend to him. He shall be the head, and you shall be the tail. That's where we're heading. We've ignored the warnings. We've turned our nation over to a sick, perverse society who will not obey God or be obedient to the commandments of God and is going to be destroyed. All right. Tough segment. But those are the facts. I hope that you will pay attention and share that with everybody that you know. All right, let's take a break now. And we're going to come back. We're going to talk about a little segment people never think to ask about is, why isn't the seventh day of the feast holy? But let's take a break, and we're going to look at a little segment, just about two minutes long. This is the Bible. Take a look. I'll be right back. It's meant to be opened, explored, pursued. It's made to be read, reread, applied, and used. The sword of the Spirit. The Word of God, with wisdom life-changing to lead us on. It's made for guidance to teach us His ways, showing what's true, right, and worthy of praise. It's meant to be hidden deep in our hearts, daily examined as the morning starts. No greater glimpse of God do we have. A lamp to our feet and a light to our path. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He restores my soul. He guides me in the paths of righteousness. For his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil. For you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You have anointed my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and loving kindness will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. All right, welcome back. I hope you enjoyed that. That's a, I actually was two videos put together. We thought that would be appropriate. Talking about the Bible to take one of the Psalms and play it. All right, let's get into the nugget portion of the program today. The seventh day of the feast. Why isn't that a holy day? Seventh day of the week is a holy day. On the days of unleavened bread, you get the first day and the last day. So the question from last week was, why isn't the feast of tabernacle seventh day holy? All right, so now let's, let's talk about that. Let's see if we can address that now. And I think you're going you're gonna to find this quite interesting when you go through this. All right, so now Leviticus 23 verses 34 through 36 talks about the feast of tabernacles. And the last great day. It says seven days you have to have a feast, and on the eighth day it shall be a holy day. So it says the first day is a holy day, and the eighth day is a holy day. Actually, the eighth day is, is actually outside the tabernacle period of the seven days. It's almost like it's connected, but it's an independent feast. It's the last day, and Jesus Christ called it the great day of the feast. So why is that a great day of the feast? Why is that holy and the seventh is not holy? So now we have the first day is holy, and the eighth day is holy, and the Feast of Tabernacles. In Unleavened Bread, you see Leviticus 23, verses 6 through 8. And in that segment, if you go and read it, you'll see that the first day is holy, and God says the seventh day is holy. Now when you see this, <clears throat> the answer is going to absolutely surprise you and is very, very simple. What makes something holy? There are actually only two ways that this can be, be done. First is God's presence. 
So when God's presence is there, it is holy. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him, talking to, to Moses, in the fire, flame of a fire, and out of the midst of the bush. And he looked, and behold, the bush burned with fire, and the bush was not consumed. Verse 5. I'm sorry, verse 4. And God called to him, called to, to uh, Moses, out of the midst of the bush, and said, Moses, Moses, he said, here am I. He said, draw not near, he says, and take off your shoes for, off your feet, for the place wherein you stand is holy ground. So why is that? Because he was in the presence of God. So he was on holy ground. So when you're in the presence of God, it's holy ground. So now, as a side note, when we come to church on the Sabbath day, remember God made the Sabbath holy. The Sabbath was made man for man, not man for the Sabbath day. When you go before God on the Sabbath day, or you come to church, when you come together, you're at sacred time, whether you realize it or not. When everyone comes together in prayer and asks for God's presence to be with us, during that period of time, with God's presence, you're on holy ground and holy time. Because you're actually asking for God's presence to be here. Now, there's something else about this, too, you need to understand. When you have been baptized and you receive the gift of God's Holy Spirit that dwells in you, God calls you, and I'm going to show you that in just a second, a holy temple. You're the temple of God. So what you do and how you live and your thoughts, your mind, and everything you react, that's holy time because God dwells with you. All right, so, so you see how important all this stuff really is. All right, let's go on now. The second way something becomes holy, it says, De Deuteronomy 7, verse 6, God makes it holy. For you are a holy people to the Lord, your God, for the Lord has chosen you to be a special people unto himself. All right, so God chose them to be a holy people. All the hatred that's coming at the end time and those that Satan is going after, which I'll be talking about in this sermon Saturday, is because God has declared them holy people. The world's trying to tell you it's white people. It is not. It's those who are God's called out ones. It doesn't matter what color that is. But see, it is a special people God has chosen. And if you've been chosen by God, and you've accepted that calling, and you have repented, received the gift of the Holy Spirit, you are a holy people, or a holy person to God. Going on, Deuteronomy 7, verse 6, it says, uh, But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people. I think that's a New Testament verse. I think I got that transferred over. I didn't, I didn't bring that in. But in talking about who we are, a peculiar people. So this is who we are. So one is God's presence, and the second way something becomes holy is because God appoints it so. Man cannot make holy what God has not. And that's why you can't have the Sabbath day any day of the week, because he has declared that day holy, not the rest of the week. So you can't declare something holy God hasn't made holy, which is another point about the Sabbath day. So now we're back to our chart. So now we have... The, the, the two holy day seasons, the, the spring and the fall, these are both represent harvest, harvesting to, to God. So now, let's, let's see if we can explain that. The last day, the great day of the feast, is focused on the presence of the Father. That's simple. When mankind was created, all right, from this perspective, we're seeing it from the responsibility that Jesus Christ had with the seven days of placing back in the leaven of, of righteousness and sincerity, taking out the unrighteousness of all the sin, right? So Jesus is restoring. So this, this here is focused on the concept from Jesus' point of view and his responsibility. The fall festival is focused on a, an eternal festival in time tied into the Father. At the very beginning of Genesis, it said, let us make man in our image. The Father's presence was there. Man sinned. The Father leaves. Turned over to the Son. The Father comes back on the eighth day. His representative. Also representative of the 50, which is total freedom and jubilee. 
All right, so now, what makes the days of unleavened bread an eight-day event also? Believe it or not, the seven days of unleavened bread is actually tied into another event that actually makes it an eight-day event. Just like this is an eight-day event. This is focused on Jesus, right? Here, the unleavened bread and tabernacles are both eight-day events. They both run seven days, but without the eight-day of the event, they are not complete. Neither one are complete, unless everything is turned back over to the rightful heir, and it talks about that in Deuteronomy. The rightful heir belongs to the Father. Jesus Christ restores it, turns it back over to him. The same way with unleavened bread, it's an eight-day event. What's the eighth day? Right there. We've covered that in the last few weeks, that it shows us that Jesus Christ, who was sacrificed before the world began, before it was recreated in Genesis, Jesus Christ had accepted become the lamb that would have to die to restore all things. So this event is not complete without the sacrifice. This event is not complete without the presence of the Father. Isn't that amazing what God has done there? So now let's, let's begin to wrap it up, and I'm going to show you. I'm bringing in that number eight again. And God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. So the Father's was, presence was there through the whole process at the beginning. So God created him in his own image. In the image of God, he created him male and female. He created them, which again is why this, this marriage of homosexuality is such an ab abomination to God, because this is the way God created it. It's in his divine family plan. So now, we have, remember the eight? This is the eight. When man sinned, the father no longer dwelt with him, right? And it left. So all it left us with for the, for the beginning is the, of the Passover season in the unleavened bread is Jesus Christ and his work. All right? Look at 2 Corinthians 5, verse 18. And all things of God are reconciled to us, reconciled us to him by Jesus Christ. So, in the, in the unleavened bread portion of it, putting things back in order, God is, re, is, is reconciling us back to him through Jesus. And we see that in the plan that comes in at the end time in the last great day. All right, so here we get, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth, and the earth was without form and void. That word was is better translated became. In other words, it became without form and void because it wasn't that way all the time. The was it should be translated became without void. In other words, it was created perfectly. God didn't create it that way. It just be, it became that way. How did it become that way? Because of Satan. Look at Ezekiel 28, verses 12 through 15. Son of man, take up a lamentation on the king of Tyrus and say to him, Thus says the Lord God, you sealed up in the sun, full of wisdom. You are perfect in your beauty. Talking about Satan, right? You are in the garden. You are in, in, been in Eden, the garden of God. So now look at his condition when Ezekiel is focused on this. This is not the, in Genesis. When he's in Genesis chapter 1 in the garden, he's a serpent. He's, he's, he's this beguiled creature. But here at this particular stage, you know, he says, you're covering with the sawdust, the topaz, and all of these jewels. He says, the workmen of your tabernacle, and your, your pipes, and you had beautiful music. You can talk. He was an incredible orator. In fact, he was so powerful, he deceived a third of the angels. All right, going on. He says, you are the anointed cherub that covered. I have set you so, and you are upon the holy mountain of God, and you walked up and down in the mist in the stones of fire. You were perfect in all your ways from the day that you were created till iniquity was found in you. See, so there was a time that Satan was on this planet. He was in the garden. And in that garden, he was perfect. He was beautiful, God said. I mean, you, you were this incredible orator. And so what happened? It goes on. In Isaiah 14, 12 through 17, it says, Son, Lucifer, son of the morning, that made the world a wilderness. See, he destroyed it. He wrecked everything. He just destroyed everything. And so we read now, we pick up from this point in Genesis 1. It says, And the earth became void and empty. Why? Because right here it says he created it as a wilderness. Just destroyed everything. And so God had to come back and bring light back to this world. So now, 
Let's begin to wrap it up. Revelation 21 shows this. All right, so now we have Jesus Christ is in the ministry of opening the door. This is the number four in the, in, the, in the numeric version of the Hebrew. That's the number four. Jesus was the doorway to allow us access to the eight, to the Father who lives in eternity. And in Revelation 21, it says this, And I made a new heaven, and I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the earth heaven, the first earth heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. Now, in type, the sea represents an enemy and armies and nations, war. And so what we're looking at here is like, is there, there is no more of that. It's all gone. It's, it's completely removed. In verse 2, and I, John, saw the holy city, a new Jerusalem coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them and be their God. So here we have now, when the restoration of all things, when tabernacles is over, when the seven days of the feast is complete, everything's brought back. From God's perspective, what we're looking at here now is that the first day, the presence of the Father was there. And when it's all put back, the presence of the Father is back again. It is complete. The house has been made whole again. Isn't that amazing? God's plan of salvation. And you actually see it in the numbers. It's just absolutely amazing when you look at all of this. All right, let's begin to wrap up our program. We're in good shape on time today. Thank goodness. June 4, 2021 from the home office. Here we go. In the mail this week, sermons, We Must Forgive by Steve Council. And a sermon that I did uh, probably a month or so ago, The Prophets, a sermon that I, I delivered here, The Stories Within the Story. Also in the mail this week, our quarterly magazine. If you're not in the mailing list, please write in and get on the mailing list. We've got a lot of information in this magazine this month. And the, the uh, card offering for the DVD this month is what is happening to America is history repeating itself. You can write in for it, or if you want, you don't even have to wait. Go to the website, and you can actually tune on it right now. You don't need to wait. You, you get this, this program, you stop what you're doing, and turn it on right now. And take a look at that video. That's a powerful sermon talking about what I was mentioning right here today in this program, talking about the former and the latter and the conditions between the wars before the next war begins. We are moving into those exact same conditions today. All right, coming soon to Myrtle Beach. By the way, we just thought to mention this. We're already beginning to get responses on the website talking about wanting to come to that service. So anyway, you're going to get in touch with Chuck Baker. There's his phone number I'm going to leave up here and his email address. By all means, please get in touch with him. We don't have a date yet, but we're gathering the information. And as soon as he can get settled in, probably next month or so, we're hoping to get something done at least before the Feast of Tabernacles and get a new congregation in the Myrtle Beach area. All right, so stay, on, stay tuned for that. This Sabbath, this is something very, very special coming this Sabbath in a sermon that I'm going to deliver right here. Exposing the elect, Satan's end time target. We're going to talk about that this week. It's because I believe from information that we began to find and bring out in last week's News and Nuggets, it appears that God is allowing now the next stage of his plan to come into the picture in talking about it's exposing the elect of God. Up till now, the church, the church of God community that we're involved in has pretty much been under the radar. But it looks like that could change now, any time. And God says he doesn't do anything unless he tells us first. So what I'm sharing with you today that I'm going to bring out in this sermon Saturday, it appears what God has just showed us is that he is now beginning to get ready to move into his next phase. And he's letting the elect know that you better get ready. Because to him to fulfill prophecy means that you and I and all of God's people 
have to be brought to the forefront that it will make a difference in changing people's lives. And eventually the two witnesses will show up on the scene. All of this seems to be coming together right now before our very eyes. Could that begin to happen in 2022? I don't know. But that is the beginning of the close of this Shemitah to seven years, moving to the next one, 2022. Seven years from 2015, when the Pope came to America on the Day of Atonement, sat in the White House on the very Day of Atonement, the most sacred day of the calendar on God's plan. All of that is all coming into play in his seven-year plan. I'm talking about all of that this week. So if you don't have plans to go anywhere, tune in. If you have plans, go to services, meet with the brethren, and then catch this later. It will be available online. All right, that's it. There you have it. That's it for our program today. All right, let's close this out with Psalm 8 and the Heavens. Beautiful video. You're going to love this. It's two portions of it pulled together, talking about Psalm 8 and the Heavens. Take a look. I'll be back to close our program. Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory in the heavens. Through the praise of children and infants, you have established a stronghold against your enemies to silence the foe and the avenger. When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, what is mankind that you are mindful of them? human beings that you care for them. You have made them a little lower than the angels and crowned them with glory and honor. You have made them rulers over the works of your hands. You put everything under their feet, all flocks and herds and the animals of the wild, the birds in the sky and the fish in the sea, all that swim the paths of the seas. Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Isn't that amazing? <laughs> Every now and then, it's really good to sit back and see what God did. Can you imagine to create all that? And I mean, that's just the beginning. We have no idea what's out there, but we don't know how far it goes. Wow, wow. Well, that's it for our program today. From all of us here again, we want to thank you for, for watching and being a part, for helping and supporting the program and the work that continues to reach the people. And it's going out, so I know you're, you're helping to be able to share this work. So don't forget, if you have nothing to do tomorrow, tune in right here and pray that God gives us a good internet. And if not, we're going to put a link next so you can at least watch last week so you won't be too discouraged when that, that internet doesn't go out. We pray that we get a good, good link tomorrow. So again, from all of us here, 
Have a great week and don't forget to share this with everybody you know. They're going to love you for it. Or not. Till next week, God be with you.